We certainly hope that after you'll continue your conversations, Right here, it's Mike. Hot Mike, Mouse goes speaking in. Mike Chuck. Good evening. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this Manhattan Institute event on the future of police proactivity. I am Hannah Myers, Director of Policing and Public Safety for the Manhattan Institute. In the past few years, ideas about police whom they should be, how many there should be, what they should be involved in, and how they should engage with people has been in enormous flux. Uh, so it is the perfect moment to step back and ask, how proactive are police now and why? And how proactive do we want them to be? And is there any consensus at all around that? Um, we have an incredibly credentialed panel here tonight uh, to discuss this and these critical questions. So before our moderator introduces them and says more about the topic, I will introduce him. Peter Moskos is professor in the Department of Law, Police Science, and Criminal Justice Administration at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice right here in New York City. He has a PhD and an MA in sociology from Harvard, as well as a BA in sociology from Princeton. He was a Baltimore City police officer and is the director of John Jay College's NYPD Executive Master's Leadership Program. Peter is also faculty member in CUNY's doctoral program in sociology and has taught introductory criminal justice classes at LaGuardia Community College in Queens and is a senior fellow of the Yale Urban Ethnography Project. He is also the founder of the Violence Reduction Project. Peter's next book, very appropriately for our topic tonight, is about the 1990s New York City crime drop told from the perspective of police officers who were on the job. His previous three books, Cop in the Hood, In Defense of Flogging, and Greek Americans, I recommend all three, uh, have won high praise and earned him recognition as one of Atlantic Magazine's Brave Thinkers of the Month. He has also published in the Washington Post, Washington Monthly, New York Times, CNN, McLean's, Pacific Standard, Slate, The Chronicle of Higher Education, among many others, and he runs the fantastic Quality Policing podcast and blog, which I commend to you all, especially if, if what brings you here is an interest in this topic tonight. Peter, thank you so much. Thank you, Hannah. <laughs> thank you for coming here, and thank you for inviting me, and um, thank you to this panel, which I'm, I'm thrilled, uh, thrilled to moderate. Um, in the 1990s, the New York City Police Department changed its approach to be less reactive and more proactive, focusing on crime prevention and shifting how officers interacted with communities and criminals, leaning on new insights into communities, physical and social disorder, and the role of police. The department instructed officers to focus on quality of life issues and cite or arrest offenders. This approach contributed to astounding reductions in both violent and low-level crime and bolstered communities' own resilience, allowing crime rates to continue dropping even with fewer arrests and less incarceration. Proactive policing strategies were adopted by departments across the country. But along with gains came concern that police had, been, had become overzealous and unjust. In particular, stop, question, and frisk policies became a focal point for criticism of police and a growing narrative or antagonism between the criminal justice system and, in particular, black citizens. In 2020, large-scale anti-police protests led to new policies and a general pullback in police proactivity. Exaborated by the strain of the pandemic, violent crime and disorder skyrocketed, public sentiment shifted, and the NYPD and other departments it inched back towards proactivity quite recently. Yet officers still appear far more hesitant to engage than in the past. It seems like there is a lot of ambiguity about the public and officials as to both how proactive officers are and how proactive we want them to be. Where do we go from here? So let me introduce our panel to discuss this. First, we have David, <coughs> excuse me, David, I should have asked, I'm not certain how to pronounce your name, the last name, I wanna get it right. Soros. Soros, thank you. David Soros was first elected district attorney for Albany County home of New York State Capitol, in a 2004 landslide with wide support from progressive groups, including the Working Families Party. He is now serving his fifth term in that office, where he has built a reputation for community partnership. 
He established a community accountability board involving community members in turning youth away from crime and drugs and created public integrity and financial crime units. David has served as president of the District Attorneys Association of the State of New York, is on the President's Advisory Council for the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys, and served on New York's Moreland Commission investigating public corruption. David has received numerous awards, including the Whitney M. Young Community Partner Award and from the National Animal Legal Defense Fund. He serves as a mentor in Bethlehem Youth Court, teaches about the criminal justice system and making good life decisions in the Albany Public Schools, and is a board member of the Boys and Girls Club of Albany. David holds degrees from Albany Law School and Cornell University. Kenneth E. Corey served 34 years with the New York City Police Department, retiring last November as Chief of Department, responsible for coordinating and managing the agency's operational bureaus. In his prior <clears throat> role as the Chief of Training, he was responsible for the creation, delivery, and supervision of training programs for police officer recruits, executive and management level employees. Among earlier roles, he was also entrusted by then Commissioner William Bratton with overhauling the department's investigation of officer-involved shootings, leading to the creation of the Force Investigation Division. Chief Corey has commanded the Medical Division, the 76th Precinct, and the investigation units of both Intelligence Division and Patrol Borough Brooklyn South. He served as the Executive Officer of Patrol Borough Brooklyn South and the 72nd Precinct. He held leadership roles uh, within the Organized Crime Control Bureau. Ken served as a board member of the New York State Metropolitan Police Training Council and the New York State Law Enforcement Agency Accreditation Council. He's also an adjunct professor at St. John's University and has volunteered as a CYO basketball coach and a boy, uh, boy Scout troop leader, which probably comes from your experience as chief of department. It's very simple, <laughs> herding cats. Um, <laughs> Morgan C. Williams Jr. is an associate professor of economics at Barnard College, Columbia University. His research addresses the economic consequences of crime and incarceration policy in the US with a particular focus on racial inequality. His work examines questions like the economic detriments uh, determinants of racial disparities in homicide and policing to understanding the impact of criminal history disclosure requirements on racial differences in labor markets <clears throat> and recidivism outcomes. Morgan is also a previous recipient of the New York University Provost Postdoctoral Fellowship, National Bureau of Economic Research Predoctoral Fellowship, and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Predoctoral Fellowship, and a U.S. Fulbright Scholar Award. He received his PhD in economics from the City University of New York Graduate Center, his master's of public health from the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health, and he is a proud graduate of Morehouse College. So thank you all for attending and for being here. Um, I'd like to start this with a general question um, for each, if you could maybe just take it in order, on how proactive you think officers are right now um, and how that impacts public safety yeah so not as proactive as as we'd like them to be that's for sure but more proactive than they were so you've got to go back you know you've really got to go back to 2014 um and that's when the, the police department started moving out of this you know the business of proactive policing right the, the uh you know a new mayor different focus on policing and so police officers were uh encouraged i guess to to pull back we got them back into it in starting last March. Um, you know, we asked them to go back and, and to start engaging on these quality of life violations again. A couple of challenges in there. One, we had really an entire generation of patrol officers now that had never policed that way before. Now, that wasn't completely foreign because, as you pointed out, prior to the 1990s, neither had anybody else, myself included, right? And, and we learned. Um, so they are they are definitely engaged. The number of uh, of summonses and the quality of the summonses has steadily increased and continues to increase, but it's still far below what it was, um, you know, even five years ago. Mm. Well, Morgan, go ahead. All right, sure. So uh, you know, I think one thing that I'll add, you know, to this particular piece is that yeah, I mean, the, the nature of policing has changed quite a bit um, over the past uh, five years or so. You know, plus, you know, given you know a lot of different reasons, right? Part of it uh, has just been changes in strategy. Part of it 
you know, has been changes in the many different kind of criminal justice policies that have been rolled out over the past few years. Um, you can think about gun control, you could think about bail reform, you can think about a number of different things that not only kind of change, um, you know, just the number of the, you know, interactions that are going to take place on, on the street on a given day, uh, but also the incentives too, right? I mean, a big, you know, kind of sticking point for this particular kind of area of conversation has been, you know, gun arrests, right? And what gun arrests, you know, where exactly are they going? Um, you know, how are they being prosecuted? These are very important questions that are going to exist out there uh, and have to be answered in concert uh, with a lot of these different reforms that have taken place over the past few years. So, you know, I, I certainly agree um, that, you know, the, the, the type of uh, proactive policing that, you know, many of us kind of came to learn about and, and know, uh, you know, throughout the 90s and a little bit afterwards uh, has changed a great deal. And um, a big part of it is just going to be seeing how it kind of fits uh, within this kind of, uh, you know, more so, uh, you know, recent times and, and calls for demands for policing. I, I think uh, in, in all of my time as, as, a, as a line prosecutor, as well as providing leadership for my organization, I've seen, um, I've seen the community policing um, at its highest. Uh, it, it, and I've also witnessed most recently um, almost the extinction of, of community policing. A large part of it uh, has to do with both professional risks um, and, and professional rewards. I can honestly say that um, uh, I, I know someone, and I think you mentioned uh, change, changes in leadership starting back in 2014 in a very different you know, policing philosophy. I, 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 we would we would be doing a disservice in this engagement if we didn't, you know, touch on that, right? Um, because I see CEOs of, of cities that embrace um, a certain philosophical approach that is not rooted, not rooted in public safety, but rooted in the um, in the political winds, uh, and will unilaterally decide to end certain policies within uh, the, the police departments today. If you're a police officer, there is more of an incentive for you to remain in the car than it is for you to get out of the car. Um, you, you know, if you arrive at a specific uh, crime scene in 2023, um, you're going to have people who are, are there with their phone cameras waiting for you. You will also have body cams. Um, you know, a lot of the discussions about eliminating quality uh, qualified immunity. All of those things that protect officers um, when officers are, are attempting to do their job and engage are, are slowly but surely um, being taken away, being attacked. Um, and even the rewards, the, the reward of removing someone who's causing a, a problem in community um, and, and delivering some level of satisfaction to the person who summoned you there, um, th those are gone too. Um, Arriving at a scene and having to issue an appearance ticket isn't the same as removing that individual and removing the problem from the community. And so you have um, both, I'd say, attacks on, on risk uh, as well as the attacks on those rewards, which is part of the reason we do not see the level of engagement that I think we've been accustomed to seeing at one point in time. David, <clears throat> David, can I ask you, this might sound like an easy question, but it's not. Yeah, early on, you mentioned, you mentioned community policing. What? How do you define that? Community policing, so back in, I believe it was 2000, in Albany County, we happened to be one of the fortunate um, communities that were uh, awarded a community prosecution grant from the Department of Justice. And the whole idea between community policing is the relationship building, the active engagement, trust building, in very specific neighborhoods. Those beats knew, the beat officers knew every single pocket park. Uh, they know every pothole. They know all of the members of the community. They have a special way of engaging with the community, not always very uh, open, um, but but subtly know how to engage with, with the community. And, um, and the idea with community prosecution was to be able to carry out you know, the act, the action taken by that officer uh, to make sure that what is delivered on the other end of the system is what the person in the community expected. Um, and so this was a wonderful program, very successful, had prosecutors, um, probation officers and police officers 
in neighborhoods, knowing the neighborhoods, basically acting as as um, uh, servants of that very specific community, delivering the outcomes that those neighbors neighborhoods were searching for. And um, you know, those are the things that have been done away with with over time as um, as community needs have been different. I just want to say before we move on, a lot of what I hear, and I think a lot of what is causing the issues that we're experiencing now is this is is this disconnected rhetoric. Um, people who say things like, well, there's no trust between community and police. I, I, I believe on some level that happens to be true. But the one thing that we never talk about are calls for service. The fact that it's the neighbors, it's the community that is calling, that is summoning police to do something for them. And so whenever I'm approached by members of the activist class, I'm all, I'm quick to remind them that at the end of the day, it's going to be me and it's going to be someone in uniform and it's going to be someone from that community that's going to stay and actually work to get to get the job done. It's, and it's not going to be someone who's got quick thumbs on a Twitter account with um, grandiose opinions who are not from the community, but attempting to speak on behalf of the community because they may share melanin content with that community. I would also add as a quick aside, um, sorry, sorry. And I, I, some, I kind of object to the concept of a singular community um, because it implies a monolithic entity. If someone on my block were to shoot someone, don't you dare talk about that person as being a meeting of that community. No, we live in the same block, uh, but it's, 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 it, it does not re uh, respect the diversity of those communities that live in any area. Um, I ha interviewed the late George Kelling before he passed away, and he told me that to be effective, police need to be given a vision. Um, what vision do cops have now, if any, and is it the right one? I don't know, Morgan, do you want to start or Ken? Go ahead. All right. So I, I drove that vision for a year, so I know what the vision is, or I know what the instructions were, and it was, you know, you've got to get out, you've got to engage in these offenses, and recognizing the mistakes made in the past where the drive for more and more and more activity led us to over-police and to issue summonses and make arrests really to a whole bunch of people who didn't need to be arrested or, or issued summonses, right? They weren't involved in criminal activity. They were never going to be involved in criminal activity. And they made the, the horrible crime of, you know, drinking a beer on their own stoop in Queens, you know, and for that were issued a criminal court summons. So it was, you've got to get out and engage. You have all these different tools you can use. And if you can correct, my goal is correct the condition, whatever that may be. If you can correct that with a warning and a kind word, fantastic. And I said the way, and I would use the example of the way I envision that playing out, and that's for most violations, there's exceptions, but, you know, I'm patrolling a subway train, I'm walking through the train, and uh, there's a guy outstretched on the seat, that's a violation of the MTA rules, and I engage him with a, good evening, sir, you can't sit with your feet like that, could you please sit up straight? He sits up straight, we have a brief conversation about how disappointed we are in the Mets this year, we really thought that they were going to do much better, and I continue my, my train patrol. The condition has been corrected. Now, if I return back through the train and he's back outstretched again, now maybe that's going to escalate to a summons, right? Because clearly the condition wasn't corrected. Um, you know, there is there is a definite correlation between certain uh, certain quality of life offenses and violence. We know that in New York City, between May 1st and, and September 15th in any given year, about 30 percent of the shooting incidents are preceded by a call about a quality of life condition, a, 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 you know, a, um, a large party, loud music or something like that. And if the officers are able, therefore, to engage and correct that condition, maybe the shooting never occurs. And that's a strategy we drove very effectively <coughs> last summer. Well, let me follow up on that quickly. Um, and so in, in the 1990s in New York City, uh, Bill Bratton was first the transit chief of police before the departments were merged. Um, and his uh, lieutenant and assistant, Jack Maple, um, developed a strategy of uh, cracking down on quality of life issues. Uh, turnstile jumping is sort of what's best remembered out of that. And from that, uh, when that started, felony crimes dropped because a lot of the people who jumped turnstiles, many had weapons, uh, more had outstanding warrants, and, um, and the rest would get a citation for not paying their fare. Um, recently, we've seen an increase in police on subways. It's been an emphasis of Mayor Adams. Um, they don't seem as proactive, though. So going, how do you relate that to the vision thing? Well, there's a lot of ways on that. So 
so part of it is a lot of that is addressed with a warning or an ejection from the system, right? So, and and I've seen this happen, and of course, watched a lot, watched a lot of it play out on body camera video, where somebody walks through the exit gate, the officer's there, and says, "Hey, go back out and pay the fare," and the person does, and they swipe in, and and fine, they're on their way, and there's no further engagement. At the same time, summonses for fare evasion are are up substantially. You know, this year over last year, last year over the year before. I actually have the actual number, but it doesn't really matter. The difference there primarily is in the 90s. Well, Bratton and Maple's strategy was revolutionary and it was simplistic at the same time, right? The people committing the felonies in the subway aren't bothering to pay the fare. So if we stop them at the turnstile, they never come into the system in the first place. They were largely dealt with as arrests. Today, there's been about, as we sit here on May 31st, about 1,500 people arrested for fare evasion in New York City. There's been tens of thousands of summonses issued, somewhere around 60,000 summonses, but very, very few arrests. Because in order to arrest someone for fare evasion, you have to have very, very specific criteria today. And if you do make an arrest for fare evasion, in almost every borough in the city, that arrest is going to be declined prosecution in the complaint room. So why am I making this arrest when nothing's going to happen with it? And if anything, I am now, as a police officer, have put myself in jeopardy because what's going to happen is I'm probably going to get a complaint. I'm absolutely going to get sued. The person is going to use the district attorney's decision to decline to prosecute as the evidence to support their lawsuit that I never should have arrested them in the first place. The city is going to give them a little bit of money to make them go away, nuisance value. And somewhere down the road, somebody is going to look at my history online and say, Oh, look at this. Corey has 10 complaints and he's been sued six times. It cost the city $50,000. What's he doing on the street? He's a terrible cop. And now, since the repeal of 50A in 2020, in which now all, all of this is public, CCRB took the step of meaning that every single complaint that's filed <coughs> is listed. They, they put it up on their website. It's made public. Whether that complaint was substantiated, unsubstantiated, proven to be factually untrue, it is still listed. And when that data dump happened, we had retired police officers working security jobs, volunteering for youth sports, who were asked to leave, who lost their jobs, were told they could no longer volunteer because of their complaint history. Oh, you have six complaints of abuse. Well, a complaint of abuse of authority in New York City means I didn't offer you my business card after I stopped you, right? It doesn't mean I was brutal. It doesn't mean that I did anything physically harmful. So they know very well that this complaint that they get today will likely follow them well into their retirement years. Mm. Morgan, can you give us a vision thing? Yeah, well, Sorry. <laughs> I, well, I think the vision's been painted already, but, um, <laughs> you know, I, I think the, the one thing I, I could add to this is, is more so, you know, just the idea that, you know, a number of you know, departments throughout the country um, are facing kind of, you know, challenges with recruiting people that want to in, in, in enforce that vision. Right. Um, the idea um, that, hey, I can go out and make a difference by kind of, you know, maybe, you know, kind of getting someone to, uh, you know, adhere to some very simple kind of quality of life things or to be able to take on some more of the serious crime that exists out there. One way or another, uh, the incentives have just changed so much that if you do kind of make, you know, one of those sorts of kind of, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, stops or inquiries like why you want to train. I mean, you're not going to get the benefit of the doubt. Right. I mean, so, you know, when you kind of take that part away. Uh, you start to see a lot of people into eventually become demoralized, right, among the ranks and the ideas that, hey, you know, no matter what I do, no matter how much I put myself on the line, no matter what I might risk, even if I decide to take on a different career, you know, given these sorts of data dumps, now to be fair, economists, we haven't touched the CCRB data because we know better, but uh, there are plenty of others that have kind of published, you know, you know, preliminary analysis that I wouldn't publish in my church, you know, bulletin. Um, so, I mean, there's, you know, a, a lot of concerns about those sorts of things and, you know, many departments are now kind of operating under staffing levels and, and that only exacerbates the problem, right? So, uh, if anything, I think one of the problems with the vision is just getting people that, you know, honestly want to enter the profession and do a good job, uh, to be able to see the value in, in doing some of those things. So uh, that's pretty much what I want. Could you maybe keep going a bit though, talk, <clears throat> if you would talk about your research a bit, you, if I'm, please. I hope I summarize this right, but you found that having more police officers disproportionately benefit um, black city residents. Um, at the same time, additional officers can also create tensions in black communities by increasing arrests for low level crimes. 
I don't know if you just, I could be more specific, but I, could you maybe just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, one of the things that I do as an economist, a lot of my work can you know, focus on the economics of crime and uh, more specifically, you know, racial inequality within this space. And uh, one of the papers that I kind of worked on more recently with my brilliant colleagues, Aaron Chalfin and Ben Hansen and Emily Weisburst, uh, tackled this exact question, right? You might you know, be surprised, but there are some people who question whether or not cops reduce crime. Um, and, you know, within the economics profession, you know, we've seen a number of different papers, but also in criminology and elsewhere, uh, that seems to suggest that this exactly happened, right? But within, you know, popular news, this isn't necessarily discussed. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to do is we said, hey, there's this very nice literature out there uh, that uses all of these kind of very fancy kind of natural experiments, right? Things that are just changes in policy that have no other kind of alternative explanation behind them, but allows for us to do something akin to what we might want to do if we were able to do a controlled experiment ourselves. And so uh, one of those sorts of policies were the, the COPS grants, right? It was issued by the DOJ. Uh, a number of them, you know, it obviously came, you know, about through the 1994 uh, legislation, but uh, you know, they were very popular, you know, kind of going into the 90s, really wanted to play, you know, more than 100,000 officers on the street uh, throughout America, enhanced technology within departments, et cetera. And, you know, these grants were kind of pivotal to making meaningful changes in police employment, right? So uh, one of the things that we kind of do within the papers that we say, hey, a number of these, you know, papers that look at the uh, impact of police employment on crime uh, before us is pretty much just focused on, hey, what happens to, you know, property crime or what happens to, uh, drug arrest or something along those lines. Uh, one of the things that, you know, I, I felt as a we could kind of add to the discussion was to see whether or not these benefits or costs, quote unquote, might differ, you know, depending on the types of neighborhoods that you were coming from. And so you might believe that, hey, you know, in black neighborhoods, you know, uh, for example, you know, we account for about 13 percent of the population, about 50 percent of the homicides. Right. So we might believe that any sorts of benefits that might accrue from increasing the size of the police force might take place in many black communities, right? Uh, but there's also this idea that maybe there might be some costs associated with it too. So we leveraged, you know, this policy change, you know, through, you know, pretty much, you know, using uh, decades of data going back to the 1980s. Uh, and what we end up finding is that, yeah, I mean, it seems as if you hire an additional officer, uh, the effect on black and white homicide seems to be the same. We see a reduction among both groups. However, if you look at it in per capita terms, uh, those effects are twice as large for Black Americans and white Americans. So that's actually good news to kind of take away from this idea that, hey, we increase the size of the police force, uh, we can make meaningful improvements on a very socially costly outcome. However, we, we also find, which is, you know, an, another benefit that kind of goes along with it, is that when you hire an additional officer, you reduce index crime and also index arrest. So there might be some sort of double, double dividend there, and that not only can we kind of you know, avoid kind of making these very kind of costly, you know, index arrests that are going to send people to prison for a long time, we can also reduce crime at the same time just by kind of expanding the ranks. Now, one of the things that you kind of hinted at, Peter, was the idea that, you know, another finding that we end up coming across was the idea that maybe uh, when you do increase the size of the police force, you are seeing increases in quality life arrests disproportionately for more the discretionary stuff like alcohol, uh, public alcohol consumption or, or noise complaints and things like that. And, you know, what is causing that is a, a bit of a, you know, more kind of uh, interesting question. I mean, some people automatically jump and say, aha, you know, this must be discrimination. Well, you know, it doesn't have to be, right? It could just be, you know, that, hey, there's more of these sorts of, you know, kind of criminal offenses within particular neighborhoods. I mean, it's two different sides to the arrest story, so I don't kind of probe too much into that. Uh, but the takeaway message is that it does seem as if, you know, expanding the size of the police force is going to, you know, make meaningful improvements in crime. And, you know, this is something that we want to take into account, given my point before, that, you know, many departments are having a hard time filling the ranks uh, these things, in addition to kind of very explicit uh, policy actions meant to kind of change the size of, you know, police funding or the size of the ranks, um, these are these are things that are going to be costly for people that, you know, typically are just, you know, not seen uh, as much within this discussion. Maybe not, you know, the, the Twitter fingers, you know, kind of crowd, you know, the people that actually have to deal with changes in, in gun violence and things of the like. David, let me ask you, in terms of these <clears throat> more... I mean, these are shorthands. I don't like using these terms. So in terms of more aggressive policing um, and prosecution, and from a prosecutor's perspective, do you see more benefit? Uh, and it may not be a sort of binary choice here, but do you see more benefit from a how, holding a potential hammer over someone's head? How does that balance with community relations? In effect, like if you're not, if you're not arresting people, you might increase relations at one level. If you are arresting people, someone may want to turn and you know you might. Clear, clear a body on that one. So how, how 
Tell me about that. Uh, you know what's interesting? People who are in the life, so to speak, they, they're, you know, it's that honor amongst these. People who are doing wrong, they know they're doing wrong. And, and when they're apprehended, there's a certain level of honesty about that. And that's the... That's like the kind of relationship that only an arresting officer, um, a defendant, the prosecutor, defense attorney, those conversations that take place in those rooms that are never talked about. There's a certain honesty. Um, people who are engaged in certain activities in a certain community know they're engaged. There's a, a level of, OK, you got me. Um, I'll take my offer. I, I'll. So in terms of arresting people in a community, I don't think that arresting people who are doing terrible things in a community is going to change the relationship between the community and, and the criminal justice system. As a matter of fact, again, it goes back to um, people who truly understand these neighborhoods that we're in, right? There are great people there. There are, there are parents trying to raise their kids, you know, but for the, uh, but, but for the rent, they wouldn't be living there, but because that's where they can afford to live, they have to live near that person who's playing their music too loud. Even those quality of life offenses that people are, are, are receiving summonses for, it's the community that's calling the police to come and to address, you know, those um, those quality of life offenses. Now, I think by and large, the criminal justice system has been we've adopted this um, the, the the broken windows theory, and we've applied most of our strategies along you know, that theory for the last probably 30 some odd years. All of that was undone in 2020. All of that. The officer who would have been personally and professionally rewarded for an interdiction on a low level quality of life issue on Colony Street, that reward is no longer there because they can't do anything about it. When officers and and and, um, and prosecutors are meeting with small businesses to to address their issues, and the small businesses are frustrated because of the larceny, they're frustrated because of the aggressive panhandling and the harassment of their customers. You know, they're they're turning around and shouting at the cops. Further demoralization, right? They're turning around and shouting at the cops, and and you know, those of us who understand what's happened in the criminal justice system as a result of all of these reforms. Uh, you have to stand up and say you have 2019 expectations in a 2023 world. And when they changed all of these reforms, they didn't do anything to address these other issues that exist, whether it's mental health or, or these low level offenses. What they've done is they've um, disincentivized any prosecution and any meaningful interdiction for those lower level misdemeanors and even to some extent uh, nonviolent, you know, felony offenses. An officer, and I'm not, I'm not saying anything about anybody's policies here, but when there was a promise to add 100 more or 200 more police officers to the subway system, uh, my first reaction is, oh, okay, so you're going to write 3,000 more appearance tickets that are never going to be enforced by you know, the prosecutor's office, I don't understand where the disincentive for continuing to engage in that behavior is going to come from. The reality is, as we're talking about public safety here, I've got a quote, a friend of mine who's in the audience who said, uh, you know, we were beating crime on First and Second Street, but we lost on State Street, the home of the Capitol in Albany. Hmm. Yeah. Ken, anything to... Yeah, so, uh, oh, I'm not shy. Um, you know, David talked about 2020 and, and how it, it all changed in 2020. Actually, in New York City, it started to change in 2016, 2017, which is a little more ironic because, you know, for a number of years prior to that, arrests had been coming down, summonses had been coming down. Um, you know, we adopted a new strategy, neighborhood policing, so our version of community policing, engaging with communities, mixed with precision policing, using data to identify the people who actually drive crime and violence in a particular location and focusing the resources there rather than more broadly. So, you know, 100,000 less arrests, uh, you know, a lot more summonses. I think, you know, Commissioner Bratton at the time used to use the term, you know, a million fewer engagements, you know, every year. And yet crime and violence was still coming down. 
So that bottoms out in 2017, 2018. I think 20, uh, 2017 for violence um, with 295 homicides in, in a city of 8.8 .8 million people. And then uh, zero on the subway. No, zero on the yeah. subway. Thank you. And then um, you know, crime bottoms out in uh, in 2018. But in 2017, the city council gave us the uh, Criminal Justice Reform Act, which decriminalized most of these low-level offenses: public alcohol consumption, urination, things like that, and changed it from a criminal summons to a civil summons. So a lot of people would say, "Well, what's the difference? It's just a summons." Okay. Well, the difference is when I give you the summons take away some of the tools I have on the stop in the first place. But when I give you the summons, on the civil summons, which is where I have to begin, if you don't pay the fine, it's like a parking ticket. Only there's no car for them to eventually come tell as a scoff law, right? They're just gonna, you're gonna accrue penalties and interest on it. But if you never pay it, you never pay it. On the criminal summons, if you didn't show up for your court date, now a warrant was issued for your arrest, right? And then that opened up a whole bunch of other tools. So there was your incentive right to, to discontinue the behavior so that you didn't get stopped again and if you did because you were a person who, who was a habitual offender now you're going to be arrested now you're going to be searched now you're going to be fingerprinted we we're going to find out who you really are what you've been up to and all of those things so all of those tools are taken out of the toolbox and you know you put the police officers in this position much like with the fair evasion where i'm issuing you a summons that you can curl up and throw in the garbage because nothing will ever happen to you um and then that's further exacerbated. So when you look at what police officers are actually doing crime-wise, you know, last year in New York City for, for serious crimes, New York City police officers made more arrests for serious crimes than they had in any year since 2001. Except in 2001, there were 30,000 more of those crimes and about 7,500 more police officers in New York City. So you have fewer officers with less crime who got a lot better at getting the people who actually commit the serious crime. This year, th that, that percentage is up. It's like another 20% higher than it, than it was this time last year. Highest number of gun arrests in 27 years last year in New York City, but no prosecution. 90% of the people arrested with, with an illegal gun in New York City last year are walking the street right now. You keep pointing in this direction, but I... I'm pointing at the window. Uh, I right. apologize. <laughs> David, why I, do you I, let this happen here in New York We should City? switch seats. I was pointing at the window. <laughs> Walking the street right now. You know, we've known for years, and, and you know, the crime is driven by a small number of people, and, and you could point to whether it's retail theft, whether it's more serious crime. You know, I remember an interview I did in November before I left where I talked about the 19th Precinct not far from here on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, where you had 43 people who had been, none of whom lived in the 19th precinct, who had been arrested over 500 times last year in that precinct for grand larceny and more than 1,100 times citywide. And yet they continue to go out every day and steal because that's their job. You had 367 people arrested last year, 6,600 times for retail theft. Those 307, 367 people accounted for one third of all the arrests for shoplifting in New York City last year. A very small number of people, yet, they're not being addressed. Um, I have some data here that just to back up. Hopefully, what you it said. doesn't contradict mine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in Manhattan, misdemeanor case dismissals rose rose from seventeen percent of cases in twenty seventeen to half of all uh, disposed misdemeanors so far this year. Uh, violation and infraction dismissals went from uh, six percent dismissal rate to thirty six percent of cases. Um, I mean, academics can debate forever what the impact of this, but the idea that this stuff doesn't have an impact just sort of pushes levels of, of logical um, absurdity. You know, the, I just, if I can touch on something, um, most communities north of the George Washington Bridge um, look more like mine, right? You have, um, in Albany County, you have 300,000 people. Um, but we have the city, our urban center is 100,000, so it's a third of the county. But 80% of all of my violence takes place in what I would consider to be maybe about four or five of these very large city blocks. All of it. Right? So in Albany County, when we say, okay, um, there's been a 34% a increase in violent crime from 20... Uh, 23 to, to 2019, 2018, before these reforms. Uh, 
people think, okay, well, it's 30 something percent, 300,000 people. No, no, no. It's 30 plus percent in that small space. And every victim looks like me, right? So th this issue isn't one of, th this isn't so much a, a, an ideological issue for me, right? It's like the reality is criminal justice system are victims who are coming in to our system who are going to hospitals every day more look like me. And it's the neighbors, it's, it's the people who live in the same community that are perpetrating the harm. So when I'm down the hill from the Capitol and, you know, you hear the rhetoric of, of how, you know, there's disproportionate number of people that look like me being arrested. And therefore we got to change this. We've got to do, well, what, what are you saying to the victims? But what are you saying to victims of crime? Um, and, and that's the reason why some of us in this room are so adamant about, uh, about lending our voices to this conversation, but all these other conversations. When you have a slowdown in police engagement and police and community policing and getting out of the car, it, it, it means more people are being harmed. And in communities like mine, most of those people being harmed are people that look like me. Let me ask about the role of leadership. Um, the So like Mayor Adams has um, a deputy mayor for public safety, sort of an unusual role um, in the direct contact with um, the police department. Um, how, whether it's, his relation with the police commissioner or the mayor's involvement? Um, what do we want from our, our, our elected leaders and our unelected leaders? Well, you know, we certainly want support. Um, you know, the police officers need to know that, that they're, you know, if our elected officials truly represent the people or if they're doing their jobs properly, then they are supposed to be representing the communities that elected them, then they want to know that those communities support them in the form of their elected officials. Um, but I'm also a, uh, and, and I'll butcher the quote, so I won't even bother trying, but I'm a big fan of the Teddy Roosevelt, you know, philosophy that, you know, good leader picks the right people and then has the good sense to stay out of their way and let them do their job, right? There can only be one person in charge. You can't have a lot of different, you know, fingers in the soup. So, you know, the mayor gives the division, the, the direction of, of, of the way that he wants policing to go based on what he believes his mandate is, and then has to entrust the police commissioner to actually, you know, carry that out. And in this case, she is, she's the expert, you know, policing has changed, as we pointed out, you know, forget how much it's changed in the last three years, it's changed dramatically in the last decade or two, and barely resembles um, the way that I policed, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s. Let me flip that around briefly. What's the role of the police unions? They get a lot of flack. New York has some interesting history with police unions. They're different in different cities, um, but do they represent the police officers? So the job, you know, I, I think the job of the police union is much like, you know, any any union, right? Their job is collective bargaining and their job is to represent their members. And that doesn't mean it matter if it's the police union or the, you know, transport workers or, or the teachers union, their job is to represent and defend their members. That is not always pleasant. Um, but their job is to, you know, secure the best pay benefits and working conditions for the membership that will often be at odds with, I think, um, it will certainly be at odds with management as, as labor and management are often at odds. It will sometimes even appear to be, you know, an affront to common decency when you have a particularly uh, horrific incident that occurs that is plainly wrong and should not occur. And yet you have the police union having to defend this person because that is their role. That's what the, you know, that that's what you pay dues to the union for. They, they provide you with counsel. Some cities got unions that are a little less crazy than other, others. <laughs> um, do they, can they play also a role in public safety? I mean, their, their members live in the city too often. Some cities it's required in New York. It's about half the cops do. So, yeah, well, that's interesting in and of itself, right? So half the cops in New York live in the city, but for the last 15 or 20 years, 65 to 70 percent of every cop, you know, every academy class in New York City residents at the time we hire them. Um, but can they can they play a role? They do have a role to play in public safety. And 
behind the scenes, they are, you know, very, uh, the, the current union leadership of the five different police unions in New York City are, are very willing partners, um, you know, who, who want to make things better. They, they recognize that, uh, you know, what makes things better for policing ultimately makes things better for their members. Um, we'll be take, I'll be taking questions from the audience in just a minute, so put on your thinking caps and come up with some good ones. But Morgan, I want you to look at me, professor to professor. Right? <laughs> Just that. What data do we need? Well, how much time do you have? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Two minutes. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, you know, I, I think one of the interesting things uh, about working with data uh, within, you know, I, I think it's a couple of different folks. So on the one hand, um, you know, I, I think it's incredibly too hard to kind of harmonize data across different agencies. I, I do a lot of work that kind of looks at recidivism uh, and trying to get data that kind of comes from the correctional facilities, but also trying to merge that with what they have at the DCAGS and trying to also try to work with the Department of Labor. I mean, it's really hard to answer some questions that everybody wants answers to, right? If we implement uh, a reentry, you know, program of some sort, we would like to know whether or not people will go off to, to get a job or stay out of, you know, jail or prison in the future. And you'd be surprised how hard that is to answer, uh, just given the different obstacles that exist, or even, you know, the lack of kind of clear established channels to which a, a researcher like myself might be able to access those data. So that's, that's one problem, I would say, is that we just don't have a, a enough uh, kind of formal, you know, uh, you know, kind of, you know, pathways to try to you know, answer some really, really important questions. The other problem, too, though, uh, is that we probably just need to find ways to kind of form more strategic partnerships, right? A lot of times, uh, what's good for academia, you know, we are interested in questions and answering important questions, many of the questions that have been brought up today. Um, and, you know, sometimes our interest in, in certain questions or the nuances of those questions might not necessarily align with the everyday jobs of, of, of people in, you know, in the department or uh, in other agencies throughout the state, right? So uh, being able to kind of see eye to eye where some of, you know, these types of techniques or some of these kind of, uh, you know, analyses, how they can be informative, uh, I, I think there's probably room for a great deal more discussion on that front, right? Because we're not always seeing uh, how is it that if I publish, you know, I put out a paper and I find this, you know, I kind of use all these sophisticated econometric methods in order to be able to produce this estimate, you know, how does that help you inform your policy decisions? I, uh, I, I think there's probably some room for, you know, kind of, uh, you know, uh, kind of clearing things up on both fronts. So, David, prosecuted a professor, what can I do for you and what how can you help research? I am so thankful for the Manhattan Institute because throughout the last several years, as we prosecutors and law enforcement continue to scream um, from the, the, the highest mountains about what is experience, what we're experiencing on the front lines of what our communities are experiencing, um, where we encounter, uh, you know, truthers criminal justice truthers, much like, you know, COVID, right? It, it, it's it's like, no, it's not bail reform that's caused <laughs> this. It's not, and, and, and it is the most frustrating thing when you know the person who was arraigned, you know, in your court, um, who gets to leave your court, unlike they did before, is rearrested again and has caused more harm to, to, to more people. And that is not good enough evidence because we're going to track that data for 120 days as opposed to 121 days. Um, so we, we need we need truth. I mean, you asked the question about what we need from our leadership. We we need truth, and we need courage, mm -hmm. and, and that has to be displayed in the academic setting, in in the world of politics today, um, in DA's offices. Um, we need to be truthful about what is happening. The number one cause of harm to African-American males, 15 to 24, it's homicide and suicide. We have a serious issue in our country, the number one public health issue. And, and what are we doing? Well, we, we go to Albany and we pass a law that basically decriminalizes the possession of weapons for 16 and 17 year olds called Raise the Age. We, we are we are aspiring we, we're engaging in virtue and, and not engaging in doing what our communities need um, in order to in order to thrive and um, the world of academia is a world that must engage now and must do so uh, 
truthfully and with no with no agenda. But just think about it, right? If you had told me that 10,000 left-handed people uh, died from gun violence, you know, I think everybody's eyes would kind of be up in shock, right? I, you know, one of the things that, you know, in a book that I love from uh, one of my committee members, um, uh, Glenn Lowry, he, just, he was more surprised at people's lack of astonishment at some of these sorts of statistics, right? The fact that you could see that and just say, oh, well, right? I mean, there's probably about 10,000, you know, black people that die by gun violence each year, or excuse me, by homicide each year. Uh, most of them are black men. Uh, you know, there's probably about a thousand um, at most, right, from what we're able to measure, you know, deaths at the hands of police officers, right? And, you know, the fact that you don't give any weight whatsoever to the former statistic just tells me your intentions about dealing with the kind of, you know, preciousness of life in general. And so I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I, I'm completely blown away. I mean, I have a lot of students, God bless their hearts, uh, who come at this with, you know, the right intentions, the right passions. But, you know, for the most part, they're just learning from much of the bad, you know, racial discourse or just criminal justice discourse that exists on Twitter and elsewhere, as opposed to being able to dive deeply into some, what the research is doing. And I, and I think that's a big part, you know, look, a big part of my job is to do research, but I also want them to be able to go out in the world, read evidence and call BS when they see it, right? So, I mean, that's, that's something that I think we all kind of have a role in, in, in kind of taking on. Thanks. Um, let me turn this to you. If you have any questions for David Morgan or Ken or me, um, you, I, your hand up was up first. And we don't have that much time, unfortunately, but uh, and I'll repeat them, I think, for the audience. To isolate, we'll oh, figure yeah, the out mic. which politicians are term limited and focus the attention greater where they tend to be most effective. Uh, so that we can make sense to try to make sense of the current situation. Right. And we can make sense of the current situation. Right. And we can make sense of the current situation. Right. And we try to uh, grab the attention of to grab the attention of term limited politicians yeah. and get oh because they're not running for re-election exactly. that seems to me would imply it was a conspiracy though um as opposed to more common sense and i'm i don't know i know i don't know i, I they don't have anything to lose they won't be elected they believe what they're saying that, that that's been my experience is that that, that it, it's not a question of now now that they're term limited they, they believe in the position that they've taken and in some cases you know to raise the age i think is a great example because when you look at what's happening in new york city that even though shootings and homicides are declining they're increasing still increasing um you know on youths under 18. the number the 10 percent of the people arrested with a gun in new york city last year were under 18. five years ago it was two percent Right. So clearly there's an issue and I, I can fully support the concept of not incarcerating teenagers. But we said in the in the alternative, we were going to provide job training, mentoring and education. But we never actually did any of that. Now, it's always the bait and switch. And, and, and this is the thing that is the most frustrating to, to me. Um, uh, it was sold as, hey, we shouldn't have kids, um, you know, in the same in prisons with adults. Absolutely. Well, I'll check that one, too. Yeah, I agree with you. We, we don't want young people who commit mistakes to suffer in perpetuity for those mistakes. I agree with you. We need counseling. We need intervention for young kids. Absolutely. I agree with you. They pass the legislation and do nothing. And we have police officers who are arresting 16 and 17 year olds four times, five times in a matter of months with loaded firearms. But if they didn't display it, it's OK. They can get juice and crackers at, at family court. How about, how about 78 times last year? <laughs> 53 of them for felonies. One individual before and, he turned so 18. So this is when we say we need we need courage. We need, we need courageous leaders to, 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 to sit back and say, hey. We made a mistake here. We we made a mistake. By the way, how many policies have we've ever passed where we've refined year after year after year until we get it, you know, corrected? Um, but there just seems to be, you know, resistance, just absolute resistance. I believe the speaker of of our of of the assembly at this moment happens to represent a district with the highest number of store closings, small business store closings. And we're just going to continue to look away and say that these these reforms and the confluence of all of these reforms aren't impacting that. Mm. And that's that, that's not right. And those of us who are in a position where we've sworn an oath, I'm I happen I happen to be a politician as well, once every four years. 
but I can't, I can't run on a lie. I mean, what, what would that say about, you know, as a prosecutor um, taking a position that is basically fraudulent, that that's, that, that's terrible, but it's courage and, and, and honesty. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you for the panel list for being here and chief for your service. Uh, how will you propose to uh, overcome the political forces that may prohibit uh, the implementation of police reforms, whether that's from community activists or advocates or from the police unions, which may create a certain police culture? You want to, sure. Uh, I, I, I certainly, I'll tell you what, I certainly think that if you have activists who are actually from the community, who live in the community, engaging with police, I think that's when you have magic. I think that's when you have the best, because we shouldn't be an occupying force in any community. We should, our mission should reflect the desires and the wishes of the, of the activists and the people who live in that community. It's when you have activists who are disconnected from the community, but may share a specific, uh, you know, look, an appearance. You're African American. This is an African American community. Therefore, we're going to put you on TV and reflexively listen to everything that you say as if you are somehow connected to this neighborhood. That's when you have problems. That's when you have the schisms that you have between police and community. The other problem, too, though, is, is you know, it's the loudest voices went out. Right. So if you're just you know, happen to have a, a bigger megaphone and you're willing to point to anything. Right. I'm, I kind of give the example and I do a lot of work around discrimination. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, you see this kind of peppered into, you know, every pretty much sociology paper you see out there, or criminology paper along these lines. And like, you know, almost like paprika of some sort, uh, structural racism or systemic racism. Right. And I always ask them, define it. What does that mean? And nobody can actually come up with an explicit definition. Now, there's starting to be more serious scholarship on this. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, one of the problems with much of that, you know, kind of doctrine is that it's a theory that predicts everything, right? When a theory that predicts everything is absolutely useless. Um, so, I mean, one of the problems that we're going to have to face is trying to, you know, give, you know, our way or give our voice to more moderate and nuanced positions, right? I mean, it's almost, it's the spiral of silence, it's self-censorship in the public discourse, it's all of these things to which, you know, the extreme voices are always going to be kind of heard out the most because people are fear of, you know, fear of, you know, are living in fear of ostracism and uh, being punished and socially sanctioned for telling the truth, right? So, I mean, I, I do think that there are some people, many activists who are genuinely interested in improving conditions throughout the community, right? But at the other hand, uh, when we have people that say things like the police don't produce crime or something along those lines, you got to call them out. Like, where's your evidence? Where is the body of literature and work that you're going to be able to point us to? And, and many people, I think, if you ask them to do it, they're just going to stutter. Um, well, this is unfortunately the last uh, okay. last question, so make it a good one. No okay. So, yeah, I had a question. A number of you mentioned essentially tail risks. It's either a small subset of people or places that are generating majority of crime and uh, victimization. So I think one of the challenges is people often think about criminal justice reform, they think about average effects, say for the whole county of Albany. Uh, but what could you, anybody on the panel say specifically in terms of criminal justice reform? So if you're going to do something that was specific to reduce crime, uh, to get to that tail risk, so those, that subset of, you know, the property offenders or those places, what would you recommend? I I would recommend first and foremost that every other uh, facet of government also have a stake in the game. We can be called to a location where there's um, narcotics being trafficked and, and we can get there. We can do a buy into that place. We can remove, you know, the, the seller. We can have that individual evicted. OK, that should be all that we do. But there should be something else coming up behind it, right? Um, perhaps, I don't know, jobs. Um, we should be doing things in community where we're demonstrating some form of investment. Because I can tell you right now, if you want to know what your community is going to look like in terms of violence, look at what you're doing right now for your 10-year-olds. Because if you're doing nothing for them and you're not investing in them right now, you're going to have a problem in five years, right? So. 
law enforcement and the tools we have, we can we can pluck out, we can temporarily remove, but there has to be the rest of you know government and private sector coming in to to then invest. And that's how you develop long-term, you know, peace and safety. We've managed to do that in the state of New York. We we were we were reducing the prison population, we were reducing crime. There's no other state that can demonstrate a, a period of time um, achieving both of those goals. And we were able to do and it as over a decade. decade. Yeah. yeah, for over, but we were able to do it strategically. I, I know in Albany uh, two months ago, right? Uh, this is May. So in, in the winter months, we would be making a list of, hey, people who are trafficking in narcotics. And these are also people that happen to be shooters. If we wanted to see the summer, have a good summer in specific neighborhoods, oh, these are the folks we have to be focusing on. And what, what do we do? Right about this time, you're hitting those houses, you're removing those individuals, you're prosecuting them, you're sending them away. And we have a peaceful summer. Now, oh, no, uh, unless you're a major trafficker, here, here's a desk appearance ticket. See you on Monday and uh, come on by. Stop in. Morgan. I, mean, I, I think we have to kind of have everything on the table, right? So we have to continue. I mean, the police are a very powerful solution or part of the solution to improving public safety. Uh, but like I always say, it's not going to be a panacea, right? There's a role, you know, and sometimes we ask police to do too much. I mean, that's another conversation for another day. But there, there's a role for a number of different other agencies to kind of step in and provide services. But it's also, you know, a role for other different interventions, right? Youth summer employment, cognitive behavioral therapy. These are things that have been shown to have some promise locally. How they look scaled up is a bit of a different question, right? As you already know. But um, I mean, there's a number of different things through which we need to be able to learn more about what work and what doesn't work so that we can go ahead and refine. Precision policing is another good example of things that have kind of worked within the city uh, that seem to have yielded some benefits, but are not discussed as much. So I would say just kind of experimenting with different policy solutions that are out there in conjunction with kind of, you know, doing the kind of good thing of investing in, in, in good, solid policing. I'll echo everything that they said and then add in that, you know, along with precision policing needs to be precision prosecution, yeah. that when you have those, you know, those really prolific recidivist offenders, um, they can't be treated like the average population because they're not right, that they are driving crime and violence. And sometimes that doesn't matter what crime they're committing. It's, it's fueling violence. It's feeding violence. Um, you know, we had street gangs get out of, you know, street corner drug sales and move into credit card fraud. And then they're getting prosecuted like it's a white collar crime. But all that money is going to buy more guns and shoot more people. Right. And, um, you know, there's got to be you've got to look at, hey, you need the whole of government, the whole of community to come together and actually solve a problem because the police really aren't made to solve problems. Um, but then at the same time, you need to look at the whole of the individual. And, and that's truly what justice is. Right. The, you know, what 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 does this person deserve? Um, you know, what have they done? What do they deserve? Not just looking at each offense as an individualized action. Um, maybe as moderators prerogative, I want to emphasize uh, one thing that District Attorney Suarez said so almost in passing, but I think is very important. Uh, we pass reforms and laws and then don't assess them and we don't improve them. Um, and they're often passed uh, and maybe they have to be because of the way the government works are passed under ideological, I don't know, glory, let's say. Um, and then people forget about them. Okay, raise the age. Uh, you know, no, I, very few people, even at the Manhattan Institute, object to that in its entirety. Um, but it can be improved, but there seems to be no interest in that. Marijuana legalization is a great example of that. I mean, three years later, how could we possibly screw up something so, so much? But, well, there's no enforcement mechanism. <laughs> like, these could be changed, but they're not. Um, and I don't know if it's like how we demand that accountability to assess these programs and forms. Just honestly ask, are they working and what can we do to improve them? But it seems to be a big missing step. Um, I always love ending things on a pessimistic note. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I do want to thank uh, David and Morgan and Ken here uh, for um, their thoughts and for all of you. And, and um, I'm Peter Mosco. Thank you. Um, Hannah, do you, say, do you want to say anything? or? Uh... Okay.